My name's Ken Miller. I'm the library director. And while well, I fall over the chairs, um, I wanted, I've never had a chance to say uh, how much we appreciate the, you guys coming out and doing this talk for us. Uh, you've been done, doing it for several years now, and I've never really had an opportunity to thank you for it. So, John, thank you very much. And I'd like to welcome everybody to the library tonight and hope that you'll be able to um, come back and take advantage of the many programs that we have here right in this room for you. You can find them on our website at www.baylisslibrary.org and you'll be able to find this talk on that site uh, in a couple of days because we'll put it back up so if you miss something you can go ahead and look at it there. So with no further ado, it's, it's I'll, Mike. I'll, uh, I'll introduce John? Mike. Mike? Mike? Yeah, it says John up there. It says John. Mike. Yeah, Mike. <laughs> well, I'll introduce John. John's the one that got kicked in the morning today. From the National Weather Service. Thank you, sir. <laughs> sir. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah, like you said, my name is Mike Bogut. I'm a National Weather Service forecaster out of the National Weather Service in Gaylord. Wonder, wonder why maybe Gaylord, well, believe it or not, Gaylord actually handles the two eastern counties of Upper Michigan, Chippewa and Mackinac. If you go just to our west of here, you run the Loose County, you're Marquette's responsibility. There's actually four offices in the state, part of 123 across the country. The four of the state are Marquette, us in Gaylord, Detroit, and Grand Rapids. We all have our own little segment of the state. Simply, someone's gonna ask, well, why are you there? It's because that's where our radar coverage is best. It's all determined by radar coverage. Each office has a Doppler radar, and wherever that radar can stretch out to, that's basically the limits of our forecast responsibility. But I'm here today to talk about winter weather. The time is near. Stepping outside today, you wouldn't think so. I heard someone say record high. That is, in fact, true. We hit 73 degrees at the airport here in the Sioux. The old record was 67, set back in 1973. To beat a record by that many degrees is impressive. That's, that's a, a breaking a record by a lot. Usually you break a record by one or two. It's a reason it's a record, because it's hard to do. Well, we smashed it today. And I found out there were several sites in Northern Lower that hit 80. I think Pelston hit 81. Oh, man. Traverse City hit 80. But all good things must come to an end. It is October, the end of October. And by tomorrow, you'll be about 30 degrees colder. You'll be lucky to get out of the lower 40s with a with a nice breezy northwest wind to add to the chill. In fact, I heard it start to rain outside or in Newberry and that's the end of it. That's the cold front that's coming through. And the first thing we're gonna talk about a little bit is about those storm systems and cold fronts and being on the warm side of a storm. Anyone guess what side of the storm we were on today? The warm or cold? <laughs> the warm side. We're gonna talk a little about that today. Mr. John Morris um, put this presentation together, he actually did this as homework. He went home and plotted old surface maps from 19 or 2006 on and looking at several storms and he hand plotted these out took him days and days and he came up with this beautiful presentation talking about upper great lake storm track climatology we all watch the weather some of us probably watch the weather channel areas of low pressure those are storms lower the pressure the more the air wants to rise you get rising air air that rises cools the moisture that condenses and you get precipitation. So the lower the pressure, the better the chance for precipitation. And that's what we're gonna to discuss today, at least segment number one. So then we're referring to when we talk about storm tracks. Well, simply put, a storm track is a path an area of low pressure takes from the time it forms to the time it dissipates. To get maximum effect, to get those big record snowstorms and severe weather, you wanna be right in this mature stage, right between these two, between the initial time it develops and the time it dissipates. Somewhere in there, the storm's gonna peak out. Eventually, the temperature gradient weakens and the storm weakens. All weather is, remember this, all weather is is Mother Nature does not wanna be out of balance. Weather tries to make everything in balance. The problem is, because we live on a spinning globe and the sun heats different parts of the world at different times at different temperatures, we are never in balance. You will always have weather. Hurricane Sandy that just cut across Jamaica and Cuba all that is is Mother Nature trying to even out the heat of the, of the earth. It's too hot down there. It's trying to dissipate that heat to the rest of the globe. And that's all weather does. And same with these areas of low pressure. It's trying to take heat and moisture from one place and move it to another because everything's out of balance. It has long been recognized that there are preferred areas of low pressure development, which we call cyclogenesis, kind of a fancy word. All that means is 
an area where the pressure is starting to lower. When you get a lower pressure, you get storm development. And where a storm initially develops can have a large influence on its future impacts to the downstream locations. Most of the storms in the Great Lakes that we experience, the low pressure systems, come from our west and southwest and our northwest, from the west, from the Pacific. They cut across the Rockies, they re-intensify in the plains, they get some heat and moisture and they come this way. However, trends are if the storm forms farther north in the Dakotas, chances are we're going to go, it's going to go north of us and we're going to be on the warm side of the storm. And vice versa, if it develops well by the Gulf, we're going to be on the cold side of it. And that can have a big impact on precipitation type. Which our first segment here talks about. Uh, storm track is important due to the temperature structure around a major storm. You have a cold side and a warm side. Today, that low pressure that brought the warm winds was over in the western UP in northern Wisconsin. We were on the warm side of the storm. Minnesota was getting snow today, temperatures in the 30s. Tomorrow, we're going to be on the cold side of that storm. Although, I don't think we're going to see much snow out of it. That'll pivot up into Canada. Um, precipitation amount. If the storm goes too far to your south, cuts through, let's say, Tennessee, we're not going to see nothing here. If you want a big system snow in Sault Ste. Marie, you want that low pressure to move like right up through like Alpena, maybe just south of Alpena. You're on the cold side of the storm, but you're right in that sweet spot where you're going to get the heavy, heavy precipitation. So we're trying to look for that track, because that track's going to tell us where the heaviest precipitation is going to fall, where the temperature gradient's going to be, what type of temperature we're going to see, and what type of precipitation we're going to see. So we spend a lot of our time, when I'm forecasting, and there's a big storm coming like Sandy, going to hit the east coast and potentially us, most of our forecast is trying to figure out where's that storm going, what side of the storm we're going to be on, and what's that temperature gradient going to be to determine precip type. And here's your textbook example, it never looks this pretty in real life. On a satellite you'll have clouds all over and whatnot, but this is a classic textbook example. There's your low. Low pressure. Let's air rise. Remember, when air rises, it's going to cool. It's the laws of nature. It's got to cool. It cools, the moisture unit condenses, and we get precipitation. So that's why lows bring rain and snow. Here's the low in Wisconsin today. We were sitting over here. That's why we had 73 degrees. Minnesota was here. They were getting rain and snow mixed. Not quite cold enough for all snow. It's still early in the season. But here you go. So the low anything to the north and northwest, you're on the cold side. The deeper in the cold air you get, the better chance it's all snow. You get too far north, you're up here. Now you've got nothing. The storm's to your south, all the precipitations missed you. That's why it can be so hard to forecast snowfall amounts. We can sit a day out and think we're going to be right here in the sweet spot, right in the middle, and the next day we come in and the storm went about 50 miles to the south and you're up here at the very edge getting flurries. 50 miles can make a gigantic difference for a mile of snow. Here's your warm front. Warm front means warm air is moving up into the colder air. Warm air goes up. Cold air is dense, wants to hug the ground. It's heavy. Warm air is forced up and over that front, rises. Rising air cools, condenses, and you get the precipitation. Down here, you get the showers and thunderstorms. Yeah, even in winter, some of the biggest tornado outbreaks there are occur in the southern states because of these cold fronts that come through. These lows cut through the Ohio Valley, you get the strong cold front plowing into this warm air, and you get showers and thunderstorms. And behind the cold front, which is quickly gonna pass through in the next couple hours, we're gonna be out here in the cold air again, and that's gonna be tomorrow's weather. But there's your textbook example of a classic low pressure center, and we'll see several of these this winter. In the summer, these lows tend to go well to the north. They like temperature gradients. Remember what I said? They, Mother Nature wants to even the temperature gradient out. So they have to ride right where the cold and warm air meet, which in the summer is way up in Canada. So usually in the summer, we're here, the warm side. As we get colder, the colder gets thicker, deeper. These lows start to go farther south and south and south. And by midwinter, the general track is to the south of us and we're more in the snow. <clears throat> A storm track climatology is tracing the history of storm systems over a given number of years. In this study, John used 2006 through 2012, that's where's our best data. And this can give us some insight as forecasters where to look for storm formation. Where's that cyclogenesis? And where they form, where's it gonna go? Storms have a history, they like to repeat themselves. If they form in one area, they tend to go the same direction. Not always, 
but they tend to have a history because that's where that temperature gradient sets up. So how did we get to how did we do what we did, or how did John do what he did? Six most recent cool seasons. Cool season defined from October through March when we're impacted by these big storms. Like I said, in the summer, they're too far to the north usually. And he focused in on that time frame, so roughly a six year period in the cold season. And of course, we had a, he had a set of standards like, you know, what, where's it going to go that's going to impact our weather? And he looked at any storm that was in this box. So any area of low pressure that went anywhere in this box had some impact on us. If it goes up here, of course, we're going to be on the warm side. Canada's going to get all the snow. Anything down here, we're on the cold side with snow and sleet and freezing rain. But generally, any storm that went through that area impacted our weather. And he had a set of minimum for, for intensity. Now, this is kind of getting fancy and kind of a little scientific, but this 1,000 millibars, anyone got a home barometer? Usually they're set to inches, 29 and a half inches. That's a reasonable area of low pressure. To give you a perspective, Sandy came into Cuba last night, I think it was down to 958 millibars. That's, that's a pretty strong, in fact, it was almost a category three hurricane when it hit, hit land. But that's a pretty decent low. The March storm last year, um, I'm not, not sure how many inches of snow you guys got, I think it was quite a bit. We had a record March storm in Northern Lower people without power for weeks. It probably was one of the most damaging storms since the 1978 Superstorm. And uh, that had a pressure of 972 millibars over Lake Huron, about the same strength as a Category 2 hurricane. So they do get significantly strong in the Great Lakes. But yet to set a threshold, anything above 1,000, the higher the pressure, the less chance for significant precipitation. So the standard he used was 1,000. Looking back at the database, that was about the threshold where we started seeing significant uh, events. He looked at 73 individual storms and went back. He found 73 storms that fit this criteria, that pressure or lower, and went through that box. He did this all by hand. Guy is a workaholic. I give him a lot of credit. He did this, like I said, all by hand and then traced the, uh, the outlines. And this is what he came up with. There's 73 storms. I'm colorblind as can be, so to me that's all basically one color, but apparently there are different colors up here and with the years highlighted, but uh, good luck figuring that out. But, we're gonna, but that's not the important thing, not the years so much. More about where's the origin. That's what we're looking for as forecasters. Where are these storms or, uh, forming at? So we're going to break this down a little bit to look at some important trends. Okay, we have areas of development. One of the famous or more typical areas for low pressure development that affects the Great Lakes is just on the lee side of the Rockies. What happens is, and we're going to talk about it here, but this is a, a, a great formation area. As wind comes off the mountains, it warms, warmer air lowers the pressure. Lower the pressure, you start getting circulation around the low pressure and eventually develop a storm. So why we call it lee side cyclogenesis? Why on the lee of the Rockies? It turns out that the barrier of the Rocky Mountains is a two-fold impact. Most of our weather comes off the Pacific. Even the storms that we're going to talk about forming started in the Pacific. But they hit the mountains, and the mountains are nothing like a, like a brick wall. Hits the mountains, brings out all the moisture, they completely fall apart. You go to the Cascades, they get feet and feet, thousands. I think the record snowfall is just over a thousand inches for one winter. That's these storms that hit that, that block. They cut across the Rockies, there's nothing to them. However, when they start to descend the Rockies, the wind starts to go down, it warms the air, warming the air, lowers the pressure again, and the process starts to kick all over, kick in again. And now what it has, when it crossed the Rockies, it lost its moisture, but as it merges into the plains, there's the Gulf of Mexico. And believe it or not, even here in the UP, the great UP, most of our system snow the moisture comes from the Gulf of Mexico. System snow, not lake effect, but system snow. Two different processes. And the disturbances can interact with jet streams. Jet streams are rivers of air. When you look at a satellite picture, we call it water vapor. You can see the water in the air. It's, it looks just like a river. And the rivers are meandering and moving and dipping, and they always are changing. And those rivers are the jet streams that storms like to form on. A real busy map, this is what we call a surface map. 
Ignore all the numbers, they're, they're just surface observations, just like at Sault Ste. Marie today, there's an airport that gives us a surface observation. Well, these are all airports or other sites. And they can, on these surface observations, we can plot pressure. Focus in on this dashed blue line here, that's that trough of low pressure. That's the descending air off the Rockies. You can see some west flow here at Denver. Descending, warming, warmer air, lowers the pressure. It's a process of nature, and you start forming an area of low pressure, and then you get the moisture off the Gulf of Mexico. Here's an example. Like I said, a very, these are very busy maps. So just focus on the Rockies. Here's the Rockies. Right here, you got the initial stages, more mature. Now you got some frontal features with it. You got cold air coming off the Rockies, warm air, moisture coming from the Gulf, and now you have a fully mature in the center U.S. area of low pressure with all the frontal features and an endless supply of Gulf of Mexico moisture to help it along. So you got all, all the ingredients now for a full-fledged, impressive area of low pressure that can bring a lot of snow on the cold side, which is to the north and northwest of its center. So he broke this down even further. We know it's the lee side of the Rockies, but after looking back, there's actually specific areas that are favored. I guess it's something to do with the, maybe the terrain that's just upstream of these, maybe where the higher terrain is. We'll start with the northern one, the Alberta Clipper. Well, I, I think we'll break this down here in a second. But here are all the good formation areas, or the formation areas where these storms form that affect our weather. <coughs> he broke it down into geographic regions, the Canadian prairies all the way down to the southern plains, and we actually had some storm formation closer to home um, through the Mississippi Valley region. Anyone heard of the Alberta Clipper? For the last three winters, there haven't been many Alberta Clippers. This is uh, back in the back in the 70s and 80s. This was this was one of the every the, other day. We every other day. <laughs> yep, exactly. But look where these form, Alberta. Look where the Gulf is. Just simply too far away. Alberta Clippers are famous. Their name applies Clipper. They move along 60, 70, 80 miles an hour. They don't have the moisture. But man, can they bring the wind. Some of the worst blizzards in our nation's history are from these areas of low pressure that don't produce hardly any snow, but can produce winds of 60, 70 miles an hour right here. And when there's already two or three feet of snow on the ground, comes a complete whiteout and you get drifts to 50 to 100 feet. What the Alberta Clippers do though, see we're fortunate. We got what we call the Great Lakes. And in the winter, they kind of act like the Gulf of Mexico. They're warm. They're not, go jump in them, they're not, you're not going to think they're warm. But when the temperature's 5 degrees and the water temperature's 40, they're warm. It's like boiling a pot of water. So these Alberta Clippers come along and they start to feel the water. This water's starting to supply them now with some moisture. And we get what we call lake enhanced snow. The colder is already over the water, the Alberta Clipper comes along, it adds lift to the atmosphere. Now the air over the water wants to lift even more vigorous and you get lake enhanced snow showers. And these can produce really heavy snowfall, especially for Mackinac County. Because you get the southwest flow off the uh, off Lake Michigan in front of them and they can really hammer Mackinac County. This is probably some of our heaviest lake effect snow we get is with these Alberta Clippers. But generally for most of the area, that's a very narrow area that gets a heavy snow. You're, usually they're a couple inches and we might get some lake effect northwest winds behind it with the cold air. Now we're trending south. Now we're into the northern Rockies of the U.S. Once again, most of them form north and they go north. These are individual tracks. So most of them move up through uh, Lake Superior. We become on the warm side of them. We generally get some snow to begin with, change into rain. Usually not big snow producers because they're still too far removed from the Gulf. But if you look at the average pressure, 992 millibars, that's pretty respectable. Um, not a gigantic storm by no means. But like I said, they can bring a little bit of snow, but they're just too far removed from the Gulf. Now these, now we're getting to the classics. Now we're getting to the ones that can produce one to two feet of snow and some really serious, uh, dangerous conditions for Michigan. These form over the, the Southern Rockies. Look how close to the Gulf we're talking now. Now they got moisture and overwhelmingly track up through the Great Lakes. If we see storms form here, chances are we're gonna be impacted in some way. And these can, like I said, can be really big snow producers. 
because of their Gulf of Mexico moisture. And now they're getting pretty strong. 990 with a couple of storms at 977. That's a hurricane. That's about the strength of a hurricane, a pretty good hurricane. Oh, now we're right now we're down towards the western Gulf. As we trend south, there's just more and more moisture to work with. 991 average pressure. Um, these are the ones that can really hammer us with some heavy snow. And very sensitive storm track. Like I said, you want to be, for snow lovers, you want to be about 100 miles north of that area of low pressure, that sweet spot. If you get too close to the low, you start getting a mixture, freezing rain and sleet, and you get south of the low, now you're dealing with warm weather and just plain rain or even thunderstorms. The March storm I talked about had its origins from here, developed way down here, came up, went right over Lake Huron. One of these tracks is the March storm. I'm not sure which one it is. But these are strong. 983, the last, like I said, the uh, one last year was like 972. Um, well, I'm sorry, 974, there it is. And like I said, that's, a, that's basically a hurricane. Uh, and, and endless supply of moisture, even some Atlantic help now. Now we're close enough to the Atlantic to get some moisture from the Atlantic. And these can be prolific snowfall producers. The storm in 1978, the storm which all others are measured by to this day, originated right here. And actually attached with an Alberta clipper, they actually connected or met up and merged. And then finally we got these that form just to the western west of us. Not a lot of chance to tap any moisture too far north. And uh, they can get pretty vigorous depending on the jet structure. I don't want to get too technical, but generally these are not big snow producers. So any storms that form down here, watch. Those could be the big ones. We call them Colorado Lows or Texas Panhandle Hookers. We have different names for them. So the majority of civic cool sea and cyclones impacting the Great Lakes initially formed down one of the Rockies, especially the Southern Rockies for us, the big storms. And the less common area is the Mississippi Valley, but when they do, they can be the strongest. The March storm of last year, the super storm of 1978, those are Mississippi Valley storms. They're just simply so close to the Gulf. Like I said, they got all the moisture they can work with. The more moisture, the more intense the storm can get. And that is some of the science behind uh, forecasting storm tracks and why we're so uh, set on trying to figure out where that storm track is going to go. Any questions on that? I didn't confuse anyone too much. So south is bad, more south is bad. If you love snow, you want to be north of the low pressure. If you don't like snow, you want to go over your heads or north of you, and you'll be in the warm side. If you have anything more about the Hurricane Sandy forming up with a cold and producing quite a big winter storm? Yeah, yeah, yeah that is... Uh, that's what they're forecasting. It's where we here. Um, well, I just talked about it. What's happening with Sandy? Sandy's coming up. It, it went through Cuba. I think it's going to pivot a little bit northwest towards Florida. I don't think it's going to make landfall in Florida. But then there's a a a jet stream moving into the center part of the nation. It's going to grab Sandy. So San, it's going Sandy tropical cyclone. They want everything quiet. They want a vacuum. How a tropical cyclone works, it takes all the heat, rises up, and it has to have a way to evacuate that heat. If that evacuation st stops, they die. So they want no wind above them. So this trough's gonna come along, and the trough, this jet stream's gonna bring some wind. So it's gonna probably weaken Sandy a little bit. But Sandy's gonna move up the East Coast, and that trough, that jet stream's supposed to dig into the Ohio Valley, and as it starts to curve, they think it's going to do, it's going to, Sandy's going to feel it, get drawn towards it, and they're going to merge. And they're really concerned they're going to merge, kind of like the, the great uh, Halloween storm in 1991, uh, um, the perfect storm. Remember seen the movie The Perfect Storm with the, uh, was that, the ship that sunk? They're really concerned about that again, but this time actually moving inland and, and hitting like New York City, uh, maybe D.C. And there's a lot of evidence we're going to feel that. We're going to either get rain or snow and some wind from that. It's going to probably come all the way back into like um, Toronto before it starts to pivot back east. So that's what the forecast is at our office. So that's what they're trying to figure out. And we're launching balloons every every six hours to try to figure out what's going on up there to help out with the, the, the forecast for Sandy. Mm -hmm. 
interesting. Yeah, for, from, a, from a meteorologist standpoint, uh, that's ex very rare. We hardly ever see it. So yeah, there's a lot of us are pretty interested to see how that all works out. Because a tropical cyclone is a lot of heat and moisture. So that can really intensify that jet streak in that area of low pressure. And you know, it, it looks set up. You do not have to sign in. But if you do, you'll put down your email address. And all we're going to do now, we used to ask for spotters. What we're going to do now is we're going to send out a mass email when a big event's coming to let people know an event's on its way. And we're going to request some spotter reports if you can give them to us. So you don't have to sign the book. But if you do, that would be great. But it's not a big deal if you don't. So once again, snowfalls measured to the nearest tenth of an inch, 2.3, 2.4. It's not rounded. Snow depth, think of that as the snow on the ground that's been there all winter, is measured to the nearest hole inch, two, three, four. And in Kokoraz, for some reason, if you do stand up for Kokoraz, and there's some handouts there explaining how to do that, they ask you in the half inch, but for the weather service, it is for, to the nearest one inch for snow depth. Snowfall is the new, is the new observation every day that resets to zero. That's how, this is how we verify our warnings. When we're issuing warnings or advisories, which we're gonna talk about later, and we say there's gonna be six inches in 24 hours, we're looking at the snowfall. That's the kind of numbers we want to figure out if we're doing good at our warnings or advisories. And snow depth is a cumulative total of snow on the ground. Think of snowpack. That's the one that's been there all winter and it's adding and subtracting depending on temperature and compaction. So you may pick up four inches of new snow, but it may only add two inches to your depth. Remember I said about compaction. And especially true in dry, fluffy lake effect snow, which we refer to as less. Lake effect snow, LES. And point B, and there are separate measurements, and these are treated as such. Snow depth and snowfall, completely two different measurements. Snowfall, if you go out once a day on your board, you had five inches, you clear off your board, you sit on top of the pre-existing snowpack, you come out tomorrow, and there's four more inches, that's the snowfall, that four inches. Then you go off your board somewhere and you, and you put the ruler in the ground that the snow's been there all year, and you figure out the snow, uh, snow depth. So snowfall, snow depth are different. For snow depth, you don't want to measure over your septic field. Even in my yard, the septic field, even in the middle of winter, sometimes would become brown because of all the heat. You don't want to measure in open areas where there's a bunch of drifting. You know, try your best when you do it. You might have to, to take several measurements around the area to get an idea. So what do you do with all that information? Well, let us know. And on the handouts and the magnet, there's some numbers. MI Storm is one of them. Uh, you can call us at the office. At our office, every day of the year, there is at least two people, 24 hours a day, in our office. When you call our number, I will guarantee you, you will get a human to answer the phone. It's one of our jobs. We have, we have phones at every desk, it rings, we pick it up. Like I said, even Christmas, every day of the year, there's at least two people. On day shifts during the week, there's a whole bunch of people, but there's always at least two. And there's the MI storm number. Once again, it's on the magnet, on the handout. And uh, you can do this Coke Raz, which does unfortunately need you to uh, require you to buy that rain gauge. I think if you buy them, they're about 20 bucks or so, but they'll last forever. They're wonderfully made. And there's also an e-spotter. Uh, you go on weather.gov, which is your one shop, uh, one stop shop for all your other information. It's the government weather site. Weather.gov slash Gaylord is my homepage or our homepage and uh, you'll get any information you ever want about weather, tremendous amount of weather. And there's also the eSpotter link there where you can sign up and you can send us uh, weather, real-time weather reports as they're happening. And then the Kokoraz, which we've already touched on that video was about. Any comments or concerns, uh, give us a call. Anytime where these two gentlemen here with their emails, Keith Berger and Dave Lawrence. Dave Lawrence is the Kokoraz uh, gentleman and Keith Berger is an observation uh, leader uh, for figuring out our spotter network. Is he the one that writes at the bottom and says uh, when you're looking at the hazardous weather, he'll say spotters don't need to do this or please report. No, that we, we as a forecaster, that's called our hazardous weather outlook. Yeah. That's, that is based off what kind of hazard we think. We actually put that in there. If there's gonna be severe weather, we'll say spotters, uh, spotter activation may be needed. Yeah, yeah. Or if there's gonna be a big snowstorm, we'll say, you know, spotters, please report snowfall amounts or wind speeds 
So yeah, that's something we do as forecasters. And who are, are those people that are from all over? How do you become a spotter? That's what I'm saying. Well, that's what this. You can sign up in that spotter book, but anyone can be a spotter. That's what I want. Anyone about. can really be a spotter. Um, just because you don't have that equipment doesn't mean you can't call us with some snow information. You might have a picnic table, you might have a driveway, anything, anything we can get is worth it. We don't get enough calls, especially up here in northern Michigan. We'll be at the office begging for calls. We'll have lake effect snow bands going on. And I've been called at home. Yeah, and that's something we don't. Because I don't normally report, but I'm on there. And list, unfortunately, so that's something we stop doing. They think we, something's we, going my way. We will no longer call people's houses. We had too many complaints. I, I called oh, the lady I, at seven o'clock, and she tore me up. She, <laughs> well, she did, because she had gone to bed, and uh, she was just absolutely irate that I called her at seven o'clock, and she let me know. So we stopped, uh, and this happened to several people. We have stopped calling people now. But anyone who wants to call us, please. Because like I said, especially at Lake Effect, we'll sit there and I'll be looking at radar. And you know, I can look at radar and say, it's snowing to beat the band at this location. But I'm not getting any reports. I have no clue. Radar can tell me a little bit, but nothing like someone calling me. And the same with severe weather. You know, we can have a radar up with showing a thunderstorm with rotation and looks like it has hail. And you know, you'll see the warning score on the bottom of the TV, the National Weather Service in Gaylord has issued a severe thunderstorm warning. Doppler radar indicated, Doppler radar indicated. That's all we got. But let me tell you something, I get a call from one of you that there's a tornado on the ground or there is an inch hail, that warning immediately gets updated. And now I put spotter has confirmed a tornado's on the ground. And I guarantee you when someone sees that on the TV, they take a whole different mindset. Mm -hmm. People, you know, they see that Doppler radar indicator, they're like, well, that doesn't mean nothing. But when someone calls about a spotter, and so I get a spotter report and says, there's a tornado on the ground at M28 and, and U or I-75, that's a different different beast altogether. And people are gonna, are gonna heed that warning. So we're gonna have a uh, quick break. Like I said, I'll have the spotter book out here and I'll have the uh, the, the raffle stuff, but uh, and there'll all be a slideshow going on that uh, some interesting facts about Northern Michigan winters. Can I ask you another question? You sure can. You said the cocoa rise is not related to the government? It is not. Okay. It is not. We use their information. Uh, it's open for everybody. You can look at it. We look at it. Contact on. Had the NOAA.gov. Yeah, what, it, what happens is the NOAA.gov, like Dave Lawrence, the, he's a cocoa rise representative for our office, oh. but it is not a government affiliated. It's a, just a volunteer network. Yeah. But we, like I said, well, we use our information every day. <clears throat> this is just going to go by itself, but uh, some interesting trivia. And I'll get that stuff set up. There is no sound to this. And there's like a cookie, I think there's still cookies left, coffee, mm -hmm. water. I don't know if you guys knew this, but you actually live in one of the few storm-ready counties there is. You know, your uh, your emergency manager did a wonderful job getting this county storm-ready with all the schools having weather radios and sirens and whatnot. So, Just put your raffle things right here in the bucket if you want to fill them out. Raffle and for the spotter activation. Oh, it's going to be. Oh, no. I'll explain why that happens quite a bit in Sioux. That's an interesting phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The city would have the warm water off the base. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 
Until they freeze over. Yeah. They don't get darn cold and try. Now, what do you think happens in April, though? <laughs> Traverse City, because it hasn't thought yet. Exactly. Yep. Not much. Yeah, still. Yeah. I live five miles off of town and it was five degrees difference between my house and Traverse City. First one. I know there's a lot of people that complain about Great Lakes weather, but we really live in a very unique, unlike any other spot in the world. Look at that, minus 12 was the high temperature. <laughs> Uh, what was the yeah, about warm. Did it say, yeah, what, dates? Nice Did it say yeah. what dates or what year that was? Yeah. 19, that last year was 94. Oh, did it? Yeah. Well, that was the year. Why trees froze? It depends on where. Oh, yeah. You see, we had the top two. That is apt. Oh. Happened in Northern Lower, this, this record. Minus 59. 51 in Vanderbilt. Oh, man. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> 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 These are our primary climate sites, Sault Ste. Paulson, Traverse City, Gaylord, Alpena, and Old Lake. <laughs> now this is, this is amazing. So in all the years recorded history, we hit 80 degrees once in Michigan in March. In March, up to March 21st. You know what year it was? Uh, it had it on there, 2000. Now remember what happened this March? I thought we had it. Because I remember 70 degrees running, smelt that. <laughs> that puts the March oh, heat wave in perspective. How rare of an event. That is something, probably the greatest in terms of rare events we've ever seen. We had one 80 degree day in northern Michigan since records began from during winter, and winter ends March 21st. Yeah, that's right. This year we had 14 mm -hmm. in one month, in the month of March. So I told you sure that heat wave in March, how extreme that People was. People were on the beach in Traverse City. Yes, yes they were on the beach in Traverse City. That was so weird. Um, but unfortunately, we all know what else to do, the crops. Uh, we yes. lost everything in Northern yeah. Lower. The cherry crop was gone. I went to the cherry festival, they were actually shipping in cherries from overseas. There was no no fruit at all. Yeah. Um, the Vanderbilt, negative 51 in 1934. What makes that interesting, we went back and looked, that was right after all the forests were cleared. That Vander, the Vanderbilt location is still there, and we don't see temperatures at extreme no more because it's forested now. Um, but two years after that, in Mayo, what is that? It's probably as the crow flies 80 miles. They hit 112 for the all-time record high in Michigan in 1936. In fact, you know how hot it could get. In 1936, there was a week straight of 100 degree temperatures in Michigan. So we can get extremely hot. And uh, we can get extremely cold. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about safety. And there's a handout that will kind of be going over in terms of advisories and whatnot and what the difference uh, each one means. First, a little background information on this stunning satellite picture. I'm not sure how high up this was taken, but this is some of the detail we can see at work now. In the background, Michigan, you can see the Great Lakes. This is ice on Southern Lake Huron. You can see ice along the shoreline. This is a little bit thicker, snow covered. This is a little bit thinner. You can see the open water. There's a little bit of ice off uh, Wisconsin. You can't see Lake Superior too well. That on Lake Superior, this obviously was not last winter. That's all ice. 
Western Lake Superior is completely frozen over. That doesn't happen often. <laughs> nope. This is uh, uh, some ice flows over here on the eastern end. Looks like Whitefish Bay might be completely frozen over. Northern Lake Michigan, you can barely make it out, is completely frozen as well as the Straits. But look at it here. Here's Wisconsin. This is all white. Nothing down here. That's your snow line. No snow down here in Illinois, southern Michigan, from uh, Saginaw over to Muskegon and north. Everything's snow and ice. There's a lake effect band coming off Lake Ontario. They get some really phenomenal snowfall amounts off Lake Ontario. We get a lot of lake effect. Lake effect's rare. We live in a very special area. Most of the world never sees lake effect. You've got to have a big enough lake to make it, but not too big that it warms the air so much you don't even get snow, you get rain. Um, the lake's got to be the perfect size. It's got to have enough cold air over it to get lake effect snow. It happens here, it happens in Japan. They get ocean snow in Japan. Uh, Hudson Bay gets it. Salt Lake gets it every so often. Um, Hudson Bay gets it, like I said, but they, they have a very early season, they freeze so quick. And some of the bigger lakes in Canada. But uh, like I said, you live in a very, Michigan is a very unique place and easily one of the hardest forecast, forecast places in this country because these lakes do amazing things to our weather. And guys have been here for years and we come in every day and we're just stunned at what we see. These lakes throw up. Do you have a question? Or? I just wanted to ask if you knew, uh, this is a tongue scaling thing, how far south lake effects now has come off of Lake Michigan? I've seen it. it. Well, you can see it here. I don't know if that's clouds or not. I mean, like record setting type. I've seen lake effect. Well, lake effect snow off Lake Michigan will give West Virginia a feet of snow. Northern Atlanta. In the up, it will go all the way down into, into the into the uh, Smoky Mountains. Okay, here we go. Anyone seen this before? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's just north of Houghton Hancock. Up, I think it's 41 that runs up the spine of the yeah, Keweenaw. Yeah, it's 41. Yeah, and uh. That is Mohawk, 390.4 inches at the top of that sign there. That is the all-time snowiest winter in Michigan history, 1978-79. And this little tab here is what they keep track of for the year. So that winter they had whatever. Now don't think that's a snow depth. Remember I said about snow compacting and yeah. melting? But that's how much snow fell in that one winter, 390.4 inches. So if you were putting it on that... And, and yeah, adding them all together. Well, you get that. Um, arguably the snowiest place east of the Rocky Mountains. There's a little bit of debate. Um, I mentioned Lake Ontario earlier. Lake Ontario, because of its orientation, can get lake effect snow that we just don't get here. You get off Lake Ontario, they get a band of lake effect snow, it might only be like eight miles wide. But under that band, it might snow 10 inches an hour and not stop. In fact, a couple of winters ago, in three days, they had 101 inches of snow. So if that band doesn't move, you just get hammered. Our lake effect comes in more, a lot more bands, but they're not quite as intense. But um, 1995, Sault Ste. Marie. Yeah. yeah. Anyone remember? I was living here. Unbelievable. Uh, 56 or almost 60 inches. I don't remember what the number five was. Feet. It was six, five six, feet. Six, 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 yeah. Gun. 62 and a half inches. I thought it was 62. Yeah, it was like 60. 62 that, and a half. That, that, and I still think I get chills because I, like I said, I lived up here and I was in heaven. I was in complete and utter heaven. <laughs> I never seen nothing like it. But that was an interesting event, not to get sidetracked. What made that event so unique is we actually had south winds off Lake Huron and the initial lake effect came up the St. Mary's River. <clears throat> we weren't even in uh, winter then. No, no, that, that month brought like 98 inches of snow to Sault Ste. Marie. Yeah. And uh, like I said, that event was something to behold. But yeah, so we get the big storms, um, a little bit less infrequent than off Ontario. But you can see some places in Michigan, 390 inches is nothing to sneeze at. Taquanaman Falls, not too far from here, set the record just before that, like 360. 60 or 7, right? it was something close, and then the next year, this place, huh? Yeah. Yeah, this place. It didn't place. have the record very long. They didn't have the record very long, but, uh, you know, we get you can get a lot of snow here, so. Heavy snow and blizzards. Heavy snow can immobilize a region and paralyze a city. Uh, 
stating the obvious. Uh, transportation may be crippled, commuters stranded, roads closed, airports closed. Uh, snow accumulation may lead to collapsed roofs, 1978. Last year, March storm made a couple buildings in Vanderbilt collapse. Down trees, uh, probably the biggest tree damage uh, producing storm we've ever seen in March. Um, and then people can be stranded for several days. You know, we think today in modern times, you don't get stranded for days. Well, yes, you can. Um, in that March storm, there was people stuck in their houses, had no heat. There was an ice storm down in Kentucky three or four years ago that produced three inches of ice. People could not get to the houses because so many trees were down for a week. They just couldn't get any help. So yes, that can happen. You can be stranded for in your house for several days. Here it is, the granddaddy. This is what, uh, what I want to see someday. I'm not going to lie to you. This is, why, this is part of the reason I fell in love with weather. I was eight years old at the time. I remember the storm like, like it's, it happened yesterday. This is what made me fall in love with weather was this storm. Really? Unfortunately, I was living just north of Detroit at the time. <laughs> you missed it all. And yeah, we changed to rain. And I remember sitting at the back door, and you're going to laugh, eight years old, just bawling because it had changed to rain. <laughs> and uh, my mom's like, what's wrong with you? I'm like, it's raining. But um, that, this is what got me hooked on weather. And this storm clobbered northern lower Michigan. Um, up here you yeah, got about... it was officially one to two feet? No, the totals were 28 inches up by more closer to the... But the drifts were 50 feet. Yeah, um, I know that. This storm <laughs> completely there. shut down Michigan, Ohio, and Indiana. Drifts were 50 feet. At one time, there was almost 200,000 cars just abandoned on Michigan roadways. People just left them. Once it started snowing, the winds hit 60 miles an hour. Uh, it, everything just stopped. Mm. And uh, look where it came from. To our south. Why? Look at the moisture. And uh, like I said, this, this is the one that to this day, all others are still judged by. And there's been nothing close. There is Traverse City. Wow. In uh, downtown Traverse City in 1978. That lady back there, what's your name again? Kathy. Kathy, she was Kathy there. She remembers it. I lived in Traverse. I lived five miles south of Traverse City at the time. There is the it height. South it was actually a pretty I was right good. Right on the edge of the river. Yeah. It was probably. It was actually a pretty good, well forecasted storm and uh, cleaned out the grocery shelves completely bare. I couldn't uh, have got to the grocery store. Yeah. If I this, tried. <laughs> this was this was actually before the storm. People knew it was coming and, and loaded up. This is Grand Rapids. Um, Cars just completely stuck. I was in Ann Arbor. St. Ignace. Yep. At the time, I was working at the hospital. We took Snowmobile to work. We had to shovel out the emergency extras of the hospital. We had to get on the roof of the hospital to start shoveling. Unbelievable. That's how it's seen. My neighbor was the nurse's aide. Now you're making me jealous. <laughs> My neighbor was the nurse's aide in Traverse City in the hospital, yeah. and she yep. was home on her day off when that storm <clears> hit. <throat> She, when they finally plowed the road, she got, the, the state cops come and picked her up and took her to work because the people who had been at work had worked three days yep. straight without yep. relief. Yeah, they couldn't. She couldn't get out, they couldn't go home. Yep. <laughs> so like I said, that is the one that to this day, there's the snowfall tolls, and this is just a rough guess from, you know, there's probably heavier amounts, but this is from the old spotter database we had. So we kind of piecemeal this map together. But uh, you can see 28 inches just outside of Traverse City in Kalkaska County. Um, not so much up here on Sioux, the storm kind of cut off to the east, but what we did have up here is tremendous winds and blowing and drifting. But uh, like I said, this, this is the storm others are judged by to this day. Snow, it can, uh, you know, it's pretty, it can be damaging with a good enough snow, but this is the one here that can just completely shut a community down for days and days and days, ice storms. Fortunately, in northern Michigan, we don't get many of these, and we do, they're short-lived. Generally, our ice comes from a snow, quickly turn into freezing rain, and then it's rain. Or we get a little bit of ice and it's over. But there's been some really big ones before, really close by. In 1998, the northeast, to this day, their forests are ruined because of the ice storm they had. Five inches of ice, three days straight of freezing rain, completely decimated the, the Canadian power supply in Quebec. They were without power for like a month.
trying to get everything back online. These power, these tower poles, this is an older picture, I think, but that's what they did. They just crumpled from the ice. As we all know, it doesn't take a whole lot of ice to make things extremely dangerous. I don't care what kind of car you have. I don't care what kind of tires you have. If you have a sheet of ice on the ground, it don't matter. It, it doesn't. You can have the best sport utility car in the world with the best tires. It ain't going to help you, not with ice on the ground. Bridges and overpasses are particularly treacherous because what happens, they freeze quickest because underneath the road you have air flowing and it's cold under the road because you have that gap and that causes the whole road to cool. Unlike a road that's over normal ground that has the ground to help warm it a little bit. And we all talked, we already mentioned the heavy ice accumulations. Can they happen in Michigan? Well, yeah. Here's Cadillac, February of 1922. Okay, this was uh, this was absolutely devastating for for the uh, southern half of our forecast area. There's another picture. Uh, power lines snap, poles snap, trees bending, breaking. Um, and you know, just uh, you know, I every every talk I give on one of these, we are due. We are due, hopefully not for something like this, but we've been very, very fortunate. Freezing rain, though, by the powers that be, is usually a self-limiting process. It, it, by the process of it freezing, it gives us heat. Kind of counterintuitive, but when, when water freezes, it releases energy. It has to, to, as the bonds stick together, those bonds release energy. And freezing rain can actually warm the atmosphere. So generally, it's a self-limiting process. However, if you get enough cold air to keep flowing in there from like Canada and keep kicking that process as the, as the freezing rain warms the air, the cold air counteracts it, then you can get these events that can just keep accumulating and accumulating. So overview of National Weather Service winter products and safety rules, watches. You ever heard of the winter storm watch, lake effect snow watch, blizzard watch? A watch is just that. It means watch the weather. Turn on the news. It's probably not snowing out yet, but there could be something big coming. A watch, when I issue a watch, I have to have at least 50% confidence. That's all, 50%. I'm sitting at work and I've been watching the storm for two or three days, and it's like three or four days before it hits us, and I'm like, man, I come to work, and it's like, you know what? It looks like it's gonna happen. I'm, I've got a 50% belief it's gonna happen. I pull the trigger on a watch. Watch comes out, say, there's the potential for six or more inches of snow in 12 hours, or eight or more inches in 24 hours. There's a potential for freezing rain. But by the very nature, because by 50% threshold, several of those watches will never verify. There will never be a warning. You might never get a flake. When I issue a watch, I'm still uncertain. There's still a big part of me that's uncertain that it will ever happen. But there's enough there to at least let the public know, hey, it's time to keep an eye out. Watches are usually issued in advance. The second and third periods, just think of those as 12-hour blocks. If I'm forecasting tonight, my first 12-hour block is tomorrow. That's the first period. Tomorrow night's the second period. So let's say tonight I'm watching a winter storm that might hit tomorrow night or the next day. I'm pulling the trigger on a watch if my confidence is 50% or, or higher. And all that's saying, once again, is keep an eye on the weather. The potential's there. There's enough evidence that something could be coming. Will it come? I, I, I don't know, but the, the potential's there. It just keep an eye. Types of watches, blizzard watches. Everyone used to think blizzard meant you've got a ton of snow. It doesn't have to snow a flake. All of Blizzard's requirements now, there used to be temperature requirements. There used to be, um, uh, you know, like uh, how much snow fell. Now it's just wind speeds and, uh, and visibility. You have to have visibility for three hours of a quarter mile or less. Very rare in Michigan. Why? We're surrounded by trees. Trees block the wind. It's extremely hard to get a quarter mile or less visibility for three hours in Michigan because of all the trees. Now there might be some open areas that qualify. You know, as you go through Rudyard, there's some areas I semi fire are wide open and they can get it. But you don't have to have a lot of snow. It doesn't have to snow at all. The snow on the ground can be blowing about so fast that you can't see. It can be completely sunny above you. Wow. Lake effect snow and winter storm watches. 
Why the difference? Well, because we understand that people in northern Michigan are pretty educated and they know the difference. We all know what lake effect snow is. You could be snowing here to beat the band. You go three miles west or east and there's nothing. Or three miles south and you're breaking out in the sunny skies. Lake effect by its nature means not everyone's going to get it. They're little bands. There could be two miles wide and they can shift back and forth or they can stay locked in. So why you might be digging out of a foot of snow, your neighbor or whatever four miles away might, what snow? What are you talking about? That's lake effect. That's why it's a different watch. We know that you know that by issuing a lake effect snow watch that you understand there's a chance my house might not get it, but it'll be around. We have an interesting weather phenomenon being on at Cedarville, which is on the North Shore Lake here on. Yep. We can sit and watch the dark clouds and the lake effect running to our south. Yep. And just black over there. And you can turn around at the same time and watch it running off Lake Superior, Superior. up toward the, the yep. river and that. And, yes. and we have sunshine just like yep. crazy. Yeah. So we have, and that happens a lot where we can look at both sides when the north winds are yep. cutting across the lakes. It, exactly. We have sunshine. And that wind, any wind, or, you know, changes those orientation of the bands, and that's what makes lake effect snow so hard to forecast. But uh, Cedarville doesn't get a whole lot of lake effect. You got to have a special wind. That's right. Yeah. So, winter storm are those low pressure centers. They're the big snows, the ones that everyone gets when they get them. Uh, they usually we have winter storm watch. We might say all of northern Michigan is under a winter storm watch, or or all of upper Michigan is under a winter storm watch. They're the big events. Uh, Produced by two different things. Winter storm by low pressure coming out of the south. Lake effect snow by the lakes we live by. Warning now things are amped up. Now I'm at work. Hopefully, hopefully there's already been a watch out to let people know that something might be coming. So I issue a watch. I go home. I come back the next day. And I look at the models. And I look at satellite. And I'm like, uh-oh, it's real. Now it's, it's going to hit. I got 80% confidence we're going to get it now. Once I hit 80%, I pull the trigger on a warning. Pretty good chance it's gonna happen. Warnings are usually just in the first or second period. So if I'm forecasting tonight, if I'm at work now, I might throw a warning out for tomorrow or tomorrow night. That's about as far as I go because weather can really change a lot in, in a day. We all know that. So I usually keep those warnings for the first, first day and day and a half. Um, if it's an extremely big event and I've been watching it for days and it hasn't moved on the models, I might go as far as two days out or the third period if I'm that confident. That's very rare. It's usually just the, the next 24 hours or 36 hours that I will issue a warning or any of us will issue a warning. Like I said, 80% confidence that something's going to happen. Types of warnings. Blizzard warnings, like I said, does not mean you have to have a lot of snow. Ice storm, um, I think it's a quarter of an inch of ice or more. It doesn't take a whole, lot of, a whole lot of ice. In fact, the numbers, the specific thresholds are on this handout for the different type of, uh, for the uh, different types of advisories and warnings. For ice, it is a quarter of an inch or more. Um, lake effect snow is the same amount as winter storm snow, six inches in 12 hours or eight inches in 24. That's how much so new snow you're going to get in that period. Believe it or not, there's a wind chill warning, which we hardly ever issue, but it's for the UP, it's 35 degrees or colder for a wind chill. And that's what, of course, the temperature feels like on your skin, uh, exposed skin because of the wind taking away the heat from your skin. Hmm. Why, is by, it different? Why is it different in the lower peninsula and upper because Upper, uh, upper Michigan residents are more hardy. They're, they're tougher. <laughs> I, I, I'm serious. That, that's exactly what it. That's exactly. <laughs> because what, we're used to it. Yes, today. that's exactly what it comes down. That to. That was my thought. Yep. I, I wonder There's, if there was a scientific reason. reason. No. What's that? <laughs> Minus 35. 35 or colder. Yep. Yeah, we take the kids out for recess. Not by the city. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's that's. Well. Yeah, this is the UP. We don't mess around. We're tough. We're tough. Now, like in Atlanta, it's probably like 40 degrees. Yeah. Really yeah. Um, advisories are just kind of uh, not as bad. A little bit less snow, anything greater than three inches in 12 hours. Uh, of course, less than warning, so you got to be less than six inches in 12 hours. So three to six inches would be an advisory, or three to five. 
There's lake effect snow advisories. I'll show those here in a second. But there's different types of advisories. Of course, it doesn't take much snow to make the roads dangerous. You know that. It can snow a quarter of an inch, and you can slip slide across the road. Um, and those are usually reserved for the first couple days or the first day and a half, just like a warning. Advisory means, it, usually what happens is most of our watches hopefully go to warnings. Some of our watches, nothing happens. We come out the next day and say, well, we screwed up. Storm's going south. Don't worry about it. Or maybe the storm becomes not as bad and our watch becomes an advisory saying, okay, it's not going to be as bad as we initially thought. We're still going to have some impacts. Advisories usually mean it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Different types of advisories, lake effect snow and winter weather. Just because of the difference in nature, lake effect snow. Uh, winter weather can include sleet, freezing rain, or not freezing rain, that's its own, but sleet or blowing snow. Freezing rains less than a quarter of an inch in 12 hours, and the wind chill has its own criteria. And they're all here on this handout. It stipulates, it shows every, every uh, what it takes to be qualified as an advisory or a warning. Anyone have the emergency kit in their car? Not many. I don't. I'm not going to lie. But my wife does. I actually put one in her car. I recommend it. Um, you know, you think nothing can really happen to you, but the facts are every winter people go off the road and they're stranded. And especially if you're calling one of these blizzards, the blizzard is 78. If that were ever happened, you want this in your car. Uh, shovel. I'm half of it. <laughs> yeah, flares and reflectors, jumper cables. Bag of kitty litter. At the last talk I gave in uh, a Brimley, a lady come up to me and said, I got something much better than a kitty litter. It's helped her out many times is the floor mats from her car. Yeah. She put the kitty floor mats litter. under it and it worked wonderful. You spin your tires on kitty litter and that's clay. Yep. It just turns to mud. So she recommended the floor yeah. mats. So I've got an extra set that I don't use. I just threw them in the trunk. There you go. In case. Yep. Flashlight, extra batteries, empty coffee can with candles and matches. That supplies a lot of heat. Uh, blankets, um, extra clothes, mittens, non-perishable food, candy bars, you know, power bars, something just to eat if you're ever stuck in the car. Rule is stay in the car. If it's really bad, you don't want to be walking around northern Michigan woods. You know, you can get disoriented quickly in a, in a blizzard where you can't see nothing. A whiteout, you lose all perception. You don't even know which way's up and down anymore. It just becomes everything's white. Um, Run the motor about 10 minutes for heat, but be careful about uh, you know carbon monoxide. Keep a window cracked a little bit. Make sure your exhaust pipe's not blocked. Uh, make yourself visible by any means. You know if you can uh, tie something to a car, uh, the, the antenna, uh, uh, some type of color. Or, you know raise your hood, indicate the, the uh, that you have car trouble. But any way to make people notice you. But stay with the car. Don't try to walk out there and you don't know what's gonna happen then. If you lose heat in your home, you know, seal off unused rooms, just common sense stuff. Uh, blankets under doors, cover windows. Um, use only devices designed for indoor heating. Uh, you know, and be careful with kerosene heat source because of the monoxide threat. But uh, anything you can do to stay warm, basically, just, it's just common sense. Any questions on that stuff? It leaves us about uh, 15 minutes for a winter weather, uh, uh, what's coming this winter, which we're, I'm sure we're all here for. But uh, yeah, real quick, I, I meant to bring up that temperature for the Sioux. What's interesting about Sioux St. Marie in the winter, what happens is Canada gets extremely cold at night, bitter cold up in the plateau there. And that cold air, what happens is you see it a lot in the Sioux St. Marie. You'll get northwest winds during the evening off the lake, and then it'll go calm, and then it kick in northeast. That's that cold air that's so heavy, it comes down right off the plateau, and your temperatures can drop like a rock here when that, when that cold air comes in. There was that trivia question about that. It's one of the reasons is you get a lot of, we call it cold, cold air drainage right off the plateau. If you look up in Canada, it's pretty hot, and that cold air builds up on that hill. Slides down the hill. And slides right down the hill, like a plow, just rolling down the hill. Well, these numbers are available for you. You can write them down. But uh, like I said, weather.gov slash Gaylord, anything you ever want to know about the weather, you can click on the map. It'll give you your forecast for your very point. Uh, excellent forecast discussions. We issue a forecast. We have to issue a discussion. When I put a forecast, I got to type up a reason why I did what I did. 
and it could be pretty long and if you're like really like the science behind it look at them because we'll explain everything why the lowest forming where it's at where it's going to go <coughs> any of that kind of information is on there we got numbers for you and Jim Kaiser's the guy, he's the warning coronation meteorologist that's responsible for putting these presentations together and, and scheduling these events. So. And Facebook. And Facebook. We're on Facebook, and I, yeah, I think there was, I should have mentioned, we are on Facebook and Twitter. So, uh, yeah, if you go to Facebook and just search National Weather Service Gabler, you'll come to our homepage. I think we're up to a couple thousand likes. So that's pretty impressive. But uh, now we're going to talk about uh, what the winter's going to be like. Because I know the Tiger game has started. I've mm -hmm. opened my now. We're up a couple runs. No one tell me, please. Whoever has a smartphone, please don't ruin my night unless they're winning. <laughs> <laughs> it's like last night, we don't want to know. Yeah. <laughs> Do you use the same computer model to track the storms, like the snowstorms that are used to track the hurricanes? No. Uh, there's, there, oh, I didn't want that. There's, um, some are used. Uh, they, they like uh, we have what we call global models that, that handle the big systems that we're talking about. But they actually have models that are specifically designed for hurricanes. Hurricanes are, like I said, uh, they're special beasts. I mean, they're they're just different. They're warm core, uh, and they have special models designed to handle that. But what they what those models do because those models are handling a small area. They're looking at the hurricane and maybe just the area right around it. They need, to, they need to figure out, those models had to figure out what's going on around them. And they'll use our bigger models to start them, kind of like kickstart them. So the, the models that are more precise will gather the data from the, from the bigger models to see what's going around the whole area. And then they'll kick their, their tropical stuff into high gear to figure out where the hurricane's going. Okay, here we go, winter weather outlook. And basically, uh, I don't know why I got all this up here. It's uh, it's only one slide, really, and there it is. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Any questions? <laughs> Are they full grown or they're full growing? <laughs> yeah. But how did they ever get up here? That's what we're trying to figure out. <laughs> That's where they're trying to cross the ice bridge. They cross the ice bridge. Oh. <laughs> From Africa. Yeah, from Africa. <laughs> yep. But uh, the yeah, we got a guy at work, Dave Lawrence. He loves throwing this humor in there, and uh, I think he gets the point. Like I said, any questions? <laughs> in Rud Rudyard or Pickford? <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. Now, uh, now into some boring science stuff. But we got we got to throw a little bit of science out there for you. At Enzo cycle, El Nino Southern Oscillation. Anyone here felt El Nino? Everyone knows about El Nino. The news loves it. Once there's an El Nino, they just go to town. Love the El Ninos. That's the events where California gets plastered with feet of rain and tremendous snow, and they got their flooding and the mudslides, and, and Florida gets their gigantic tornado outbreaks during El Ninos. And we're going to explain a little bit what El Nino is real quick. It's just a warming of the Pacific waters and the Central Pacific. Yeah, what happens way out there has tremendous effects on the whole globe. Uh, we're going to look at some analog years. Basically, speaking of analog years, what we do, we look at what happens in the Pacific, and we try to decide, okay, the Pacific's going to be warmer than normal. We look, we find out when it's going to be warmer than normal, and then we look at our records, and we say, okay, this year it was warmer than normal, and this is what happened that year, and this is what happened the year it was like that, and like that, and those are analog years. So we're trying to take the years that have a similar, or what happened in the Pacific, and we're trying to match them to the same years that would happen before, before in the past. We're gonna talk about normal winter weather. Ah, the one that burned us so bad last year. Last year we had a La Nina, opposite of the El Nino. It's colder than normal in the Pacific. La Ninas bring bad winters to Northern Michigan, typically, right? Was last winter bad? Yeah. By no means, unless you love snow. Um, yeah, but you guys had more snow below than we did up here. And we, we, we did, but still well below normal. And a lot of that was that March storm. But uh, real quick, you know, I, I, I got to be honest about last winter. We, we did terrible. We really did. Um, but not us, not just us, everybody. AccuWeather, everyone was throwing out historic cold. 
because we all focus on the Pacific, this came along. North Atlantic. What happens in the Atlantic can have just as big as effect, if not more so, than to our weather than what happens in the Pacific. Well, our weather goes from west to east. Talk about what happens in the Atlantic. That's east of us. Affect our weather. Well, you know what? It does a lot. It can throw up what we call blocking, like a football player, a block. And when it blocks things up, it can tremendously affect the weather upstream, which we are. And that's what happened last year. I'll talk about that here in a little bit. CPC, the Climate Prediction Center, they come out with their forecast for the U.S. And uh, we'll kind of see how we mesh with them. Okay, a busy slide. I'll try to summarize as best as I can. El Nino Southern Oscillation, Enzo. Periodic change in the ocean temperature of the tropical Pacific. And I'll show you a map we're talking about by the tropics. It is the tropics, right on the equator. It's the warming or cooling. Warming is El Nino, warm face. La Nina, the cool face. There's your box, basically. Five degrees south to five degrees north, centered on the equator and these magical numbers in, uh, in uh, what is that, longitude. But I'll show you the box on a graphic, makes it a lot easier to explain. The Pacific water, like all weather, is hardly ever normal. The normal high today in Sault Ste. Marie is what, 40, 50 something degrees? The odds of you hit normal are extremely rare. On any given day, normal does not happen. Normal simply, one day it was 65 a year ago, today it's 50. Oh look, we average them together, we get this magical number. For normals, we use 30 years of data to try to even those out, but to get normal is odd. I do a monthly write-up every year, I mean every month, I, I do a write-up summary of the past month's weather. So I got done with September's. It is extremely unusual. The average temperature for September might be whatever, you know, 55 degrees. The chances of any September coming in at 55 is like hitting a lottery. It just doesn't happen. And in the Pacific, it's the same way. Typically in the Pacific, it's either warmer than normal or colder than normal. And they even out, they get a magical number, and they call that normal. So normally the Pacific's either El Nino or La Nina. And I'll explain that here more. El Nino, you've got to have at least a 0.5 degrees Celsius temperature difference from normal. That's not the actual temperature. By no means is the Pacific almost near freezing on the equator is probably like 78, 80 degrees. But that's the difference from normal. 0.5 degrees doesn't take much. That little change in ocean temperature can have a dramatic effect on the atmosphere. Right now, remember I said normal hardly ever happens? It's happening now. Right now the Pacific is about as close to normal as you can get if there's a such thing. After 30 years of data, the normal temperature is 78 degrees in the Pacific. We're right about 78 degrees. I'm not sure the exact number, but we're right about there. Trends support maybe a weak El Nino, uh, but lately the latest stuff coming in, the, bu the buoys out there keep showing the temperature dropping. We're actually getting right toward that normal line that I'll discuss here in a second. Here's the area we're focusing in on. Hard to see, there's Mexico, Central America, South America, New Guinea, Australia, the equator. This is all the Pacific Ocean. We're focusing right there on the equator from five degrees north to five degrees south in this box in particular. We call that Nino 3.4. That's just the box they chose. That's where they take their water temperatures from. When you hear the news say El Nino, there's a big El Nino. That means that water right there is very warm warmer than normal. This is the slide we're looking at right here, this graphic, 3.4. This corresponds to this box. This is normal temperature, zero. Zero means departure. Once again, it's not the temperature of the water, it's the departure from normal. Zero means that there's no departure. The, norm, the water temperature is normal. Look at last winter, a degree and a half below normal, strong La Nina, colder than normal. La Nina means colder than normal. This spring we shot up, the buoys show the temperatures warming up a lot. Almost got up to uh, almost one degree above normal in September, but look what happened. Right about here there was an El Nino watch issued, saying, oh God, we're going to El Nino conditions, watch out California, watch out Florida, 
uh, warm weather for the winter for the northern U.S. El Nino's usually bring warm winters. But look what happened in the last three, four weeks. It's dropped off the table. Here's the actual number. 0.1 degrees above normal. That's statistically insignificant. It's basically normal right now in the Pacific. And that can have a big consequence on our weather. There's models that try to forecast this water temperature, and they do a pretty good job. Uh, this is called the CFS model. There's your normal line for the Pacific, normal water temperature, no departure. And you can see that the model did forecast a week uh, El Nino in the summer, which we did get, and now look at it come down. And all these different lines are different models running different things, and they all come up about the same. They all show it going back down towards normal which we're really getting at already, quicker than this model's even indicating. So their overall theme now for this upcoming winter, which we originally thought would be El Nino, is basically the water's gonna be neutral out there. Here's your typical El Nino conditions, because that's what we originally thought we were gonna get. El Nino, remember that little bit of warm water I'm talking about? It might not be a big difference, like a half a degree. Well, that, like I said, that can change a lot. What it does, is now you get a bunch that warm warm air wants to rise. Warm water warms the air above it, like you're boiling a pot of water on the stove, like the Great Lakes do in the winter, same effect. That warm air rises. You get a bunch of thunderstorms out here where they're normally not, because it's not warm enough. The thunderstorms affect the whole jet stream above them, intensifies the jet stream and slams it right into California, just south of there, and right into Florida. There's your record rains, there's your tornadoes, because this jet stream is so strong, the polar jet, here we are, cannot come south. This jet stream simply stops it, prevents it. All your cold air is locked up here in Canada, Alaska. We got Pacific air coming in across the country, which is a lot warmer than the Arctic, and we have a warm winter. Dry winter too, because all your storms are following this storm track way to our south. We're just simply too far removed from the storm track. El Ninos, Strong El Ninos bring warm, typically warm, dry winters to the Great Lakes. But look at a neutral year, which we are in now. The Pacific is neutral. Now, your Pacific jet is directed more up into Canada. This grabs the cold air, allows your polar jet to strengthen and cut all the way south. Here we are. You don't want to be on the north side of the jet if you don't like cold weather. Cold weather, like I said, likes to sink. The jet stream's your barrier. There's your barrier. Now the cold air can come all the way down and flood the Great Lakes with cold weather. And that's the trends that we're starting to see already develop. Um, with the exception of today. I don't know why I'm saying this today. But we've had actually the last couple months have been cooler than normal. Uh, we're finally making up some ground here lately, but we're gonna trend colder. But uh, we'll have to see how this plays out. But normally in neutral years, in the Pacific, this is what happens. Here's another fancy slide, a lot on it, El Ninos. How do they develop? Well, real quick, believe it or not, when water warms, it expands. <clears throat> Warm water's piling up here in New Guinea, north of Australia, and this water's actually higher, they can measure it, than the water over here, which is colder. There's a difference. The water actually goes up in elevation as you go towards New Guinea because of how warm it is. The winds on the equator normally blow from east to west, just the opposite of what we see up here. The winds blow this way along the equator. Think about a bathtub. You put a fan on a tub. Blowing down the tub, it's going to take the water and pile it up on one side. So the normal winds take all the water that's warming up here from the sun and pile it up here, and they just stick it there, and they keep it there. Well, eventually something, and some, we still really don't know yet the cause, these winds start to die down. Maybe the temperature gradient weakens or whatnot. Mother Nature wants to fix things now. It's too warm here, too cold here. These winds break down. Now it's like a slosh. Imagine picking up the edge of the, the tub, all the water sloshing back. And it comes back across the Pacific. They can actually measure this wave. It's not like a tidal wave, but it's a wave that comes across, brings all that warm water, 
kicks it all the way over, la na, now you got El Nino. Now this area is warmer than normal because of all this warm water going over it, boom, you're El Nino. Eventually, Mother Nature doesn't like that after a time because this starts to cool off too much, this warms up too much, these winds kick back in to fix it, and back she goes, all the warm water piles up, you have La Nina. Just Mother Nature's way of trying to balance that imbalance out can never get there because of the way the sun works, the way the land works, the way the ocean currents work, but it tries. Uh, during El Nino, we already talked about the side, the enhanced jet across the south. I won't go over it again. Snowfall, top one. These are busy graphs, and I'm sorry, but up here is the neutral years, which we're in now, right now. Blue and purple mean lots of snow. Look where we are. Lots of snow. El Nino, red means less snow. During El Nino, we tend to get less snow in the Great Lakes. La Nina is about normal to a little bit above normal especially just west of here. Your average Michigan snowfall. Look at your, look at your, uh, can you tell where the uh, Great Lakes are? Superior, Hammers. You guys, west of here, especially to Quantumon, Whitefish Point. Lake effect off Lake Michigan hits uh, Segal County, Antrim County, there's elevation here. 160 inches in both places. Look down here, well, hey, Lake Huron's right here. Why don't they get a lot of snow? Which way does our winds usually blow from? From the west. Especially in the winter. Cold winds come from the northwest. Yeah. So they grab the moisture here, hammer the UP, grab the moisture here, hammer northwest lower, hit the, the <coughs> elevated lands, come down. They come down, they dry out, they warm up. That's why Spanish gets 45 inches of snow. Without the Great Lakes, I'll show you how much snow the snowfall adds, the Great Lakes add. Without the Great Lakes, we would get in Sault Ste. Marie about 40 inches of snow a winter. So the Sault Ste. Marie averages about 116. So the lakes add about 76 inches of snow, give or take, a year to your snowfall here in, in Sault Ste. Marie. That's how much snow the lakes add. Analogs, we talked about it, we looked back and we looked, okay, when was the ocean neutral or weakish El Nino, which is kind of, you know, there's hints it might become. And we looked at all these years. I want to point out a few, specifically one, well, two, 76, 77. Back in the day, you would ask scientists in 76, 77, they were convinced the new ice age was coming. It was that cold. The coldest winter on record. Ice age is coming, be prepared. Now they're talking about global warming. Exceptionally cold winter. And there's your gigantic snowstorm, 1978. I'm not saying it's gonna be anything like that, but those winters did match this in terms of what's going on in the Pacific. But some of these years were mild. The 50s, the 50s had no winters at all. Hardly at all, 50s were just blah. And there's a lot of support that were similar to the 50s again. We're back in the 50s. And 50s had five years in a row with hardly any winter. We're on three right now. Maybe, maybe we're back in the 50s again. Looking at those analog years, all the layers list, listed below, here's the snowfall for Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, 76, 77, look at that, 180, all lake effect. Um, a lot of years were near normal, some were below, but look at these numbers. When you average them all out, the average snowfall for Sault Ste. Marie all years from 1950 so it is at 61 years, 116.6. For the analog years used, 116.1, so normal. Go down the chart, Petoskey, same thing, a little bit above normal. Gaylord, averages 143, they get 147 for the analog. Traverse City, a little bit above normal, near normal. And Alpena and a little bit less in Houghton Lake. So by looking at those numbers, I would say the support is for to about normal snowfall. Maybe some of it's above normal. That would be in the lake effect snow belts as that polar jet kicks down and brings the cold air um, across the, the lake waters until they freeze, if they do freeze. The lakes were at record warm temperatures. It's gonna take a little bit to kick them down, but uh, 
amazing the lakes do lose their heat pretty quick once it gets cold. So, so what about temperatures? Now this this is where the amazing part of the study came in. Okay. The long-term average for Sault Ste. Marie all years is 21.7 for a winter. Look at the analog years, 21.8. And look at every site we zoom through here. Look how close these numbers are. Petoskey, Gaylord, Traverse City, Alpena. Less than half a degree at every site different. So I can, you know, if things stay like they're supposed to, normal temperatures. Normal temperatures in January are pretty cold in Sault Ste. Marie. So we're looking at normal temperatures near normal snowfall. That's our best guess. One interesting note though, every year we look back at for those analog years had one month that seemed like that was extremely cold, uh, much below normal and it varied. It could be any month during the cold season. But something to keep an eye on. Could it happen this year? Trends would favor it. But also trends in the last three years are warmer than normal. We know that. So maybe we're going to have to try to fight that trend too. There's a lot going on right now. The wild card. Last winter, like I said, we bombed it. Everyone did. And this is why. What happened in the Atlantic. The upper level pattern across the Atlantic Ocean. This might affect our weather much more than what happens in the Pacific, but there's a problem. Pacific, we can forecast that pretty good for months in advance. This North Atlantic oscillation, at the most two weeks. We can't even really include it in the winter weather outlook, so I can't tell you what it's going to be like in three weeks. But I'll show you some of the consequences when it does change. We talked about it, there's going to be a negative phase and a positive phase. Negative phase brings cold air to the Great Lakes. Forget that slide. Here we go. Negative phase of the North Atlantic Oscillation. Here's the Atlantic Ocean. Focus in on Greenland. That's the key player here, Greenland. That's what we look for for the blocking. The negative phase of the NEO means there's big high pressure up over Greenland. This high is like the football blocker, an offensive lineman. It wants to stand its ground. And interestingly, this is what's going to happen with Sandy. This is going on right now with Sandy. Tropical of Hurricane Sandy. This block can form. The Pacific comes in. The jet stream off the Pacific comes in, feels that block. And that block can be so strong, it ain't even going to break down. He's like, you're not coming through me. I'm here. You go around. You find a way around me. Well, the way around is down. And when it dips, it grabs all this cold air and plunges it through the Great Lakes. So a negative phase of the NAO, North Atlantic Oscillation, means blocking over Greenland up in the sky, high level blocking, high pressure. Greenland's enjoying beautiful weather. The Atlantic's enjoying beautiful weather. But because they're enjoying beautiful weather, we're paying for it. You find that out a lot in weather. Today we were 73 degrees, someone else was paying for our beauty because it goes up and down. So someone, while we were 73, someone was probably 20 degrees below normal today, out in the plains. The positive phase, there's no block. The Pacific dominates. All the air comes off the Pacific. Pacific is pretty mild. Doesn't tap into the cold air source up here in Canada, and we stay mild. Real quick about Sandy. This block is there right now. Sandy's coming up the East Coast. This block is not going to let it go up into the Atlantic, at least that's the thought. It's going to hit the block. Because this block is there, this jet stream is going to dip down because it has to because of the block. Sandy's coming up. This jet stream is going to grab it and slingshot it back into the eastern U.S. Real life example. That block is there. It's a pretty strong one right now. In the fall, early fall and summer, that block can be there. It doesn't affect as much. As we trend towards winter, that block has a big consequence in our weather. And there's just a bigger version of it, the block, the jet stream, here we are, and look at the door, wide open from the Arctic, where all our cold air comes from. Also real quick though, one thing about the block, it'd be a good thing if, you don't, uh, if you're not in the lake effect snow zone, is because the blocks of the storm track goes way to the south, and it's generally just lake effect snow that kicks in. So out of the snow belts, uh, some of the eastern U.S. can be very dry of it because of that block. 
And there's computer models. This is one that CFS model that runs the Pacific temperatures, also does a temperature forecast. Very unreliable, but I'll show it anyways. Here's November, next month. Here we are, white this means average temperatures. Blue's colder than normal, red's warmer than normal. November, normal. December, normal. January shows a little bit warmer than normal. Then we cool off in February and our cold month is March. Um, but like I said, this model is very unreliable. It runs every day and I can come in tomorrow and these maps can be completely flipped. But it, this is showing there are guidance out there that, that tries to, to trend us in the right direction. But I personally never even look at this. CPC Outlook, this is our Climate Prediction Center out of um, DC or out there in Washington or Maryland. Uh, Equal chance, basically near normal temperatures, it, it's more technical than that. Equal chance means there's a 33% chance it'd be warmer than normal, 33% chance it'll be colder, and 33% chance it'll be near normal. Basically, the evidence doesn't weigh one way or the other greatly. And then warmer than normal conditions out in the, uh, the western states and a little bit cooler across Florida. Precip equal chances, a little bit drier in the western lakes. I think they're banking on that storm track. You can see what are the normal the storm track to stay to our south and more of a lake effect scenario for the Great Lakes, drier west of the lakes where they don't get the lake effect. And that's it. I ran a little long and I'm sorry for that, but uh, any questions at all? Please, anything? I mean, so it was a awesome. really dry summer throughout the United States. Is that going to happen? Like, you know, it was like there were droughts and lots of fires and everything going on. We were last. very, very fortunate to be where we were this year. Oh, we had the, the 80 degree temperatures in March that destroyed the crops. I mean, the, the fruit crops were gone. But uh, the farming was pretty good. The corn crops did good. Um, all the other crops, at least down by us, did good because we had enough rain. We were fortunate. You went to southern Michigan, but if you go to like to Wisconsin and Minnesota, there's people now they don't even get water out of their wells. The water tables drop that much. You get into the plains. We had a forecaster just leave to go to Hastings, Nebraska. That's his new home. He sent pictures in a couple days ago of the blowing sand and dust was so bad from being so, there's no nothing growing. It's just everything died. New dust bowl. It's a dust bowl. So we've been very fortunate, but the hints, the evidence is that will stay or even increase in strength this winter. Uh, we can only hope they get some rains out there. Like I said, we've been fortunate. And in the last two months in my house, I've had over 10 inches of rain. And uh, you know, our Great Lakes are low. I went out today out to that Rotary Park. And I remember when I lived here a couple years ago, that water was two feet higher in the 90s. That's more than a couple, I'm getting, getting older. It's more than a couple <laughs> years ago. But in the 90s, it was, it was two feet higher than it is now. I couldn't believe how low it was. The Great Lakes are nothing more than big rain gauges. Uh, <laughs> when you look at the drainage basin of the Great Lakes, it's not that large. There's parts of western UP that drain in the Mississippi River. Um, the drainage of the Great Lakes is not much bigger than the Great Lakes themselves, the rivers that go into them. The Great Lakes are rain gauges. Now, there's been some evidence that dredging or dredging, whatever they call it in the down in Lake St. Clair might open up some more water flow, but overall they're, they're, they're rain gauges. So the lakes being down shows us that the climate is, is drying up a little bit. But the lakes also run in cycles. There's been years where it's been, they've been down and in the 80s, they were so high that the houses were just being washed in to the lakes. Yeah. And they do that, just like everything in weather. So maybe we're gonna kick out of that sometime. We'll be, it will be wet again, but the, but the lakes are showing us that we've been We've been dry as a whole across the Great Lakes region for a long time. A couple of weeks ago, we were three inches or something above the 1964 low yep. for the Great Lakes, or Lake Huron anyway. And there's a great example, 64, 20 years later, they were, there was so much water, they didn't know what to do with it. So, any other questions? In 1978, um, the slide that you showed about that storm, the the low was 28.28 inches. So how does that relate to Milmars? I don't know the exact number. I, well, I, in fact, I do know because I did a whole presentation on it. That, that low got down to about 958 millibars when it went up into Lake Huron. It came right up through Detroit, got to Lake Huron, 
pinwheeled around and then weakened. To give you an example, Sandy was almost a category three hurricane with winds of 110 miles an hour to hit Cuba, and that was about 959, so they were about identical. That's a strong, it's basically a hurricane over land. We don't get those type of winds because of friction. They got the water, we got trees and land that's gonna slow that wind down, but those wind gusts were still at times I think there was a ship on, or not a ship, but there was reports off of Cleveland of wind gusts of 100 miles an hour with that storm. So, any other questions? Well, I'd like to thank everyone for coming on this absolutely beautiful day. I appreciate it greatly. Unfortunately, we're going to get some cooler weather, but it is October, and uh, maybe we'll get some snow here shortly. So, it's normal. Huh? Thank you.